Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks to Wiley and Kila for um, giving me a chance to speak in this fantastic session um, series. And it's also quite remarkable, I realize, how long for how long it's been going on. So thanks also for keeping it up. And so today I'll tell you a bit about our latest passion that's thinking about the physical mechanisms of how one can make two out of one. And in particular, in the context of cell division, so, of course, as you know, cell division is the foundation of life, right? We are all one colony of a cell that divided a long time ago and kept on dividing. And to us, as soft metaphysicists, this inherently a physical process. How do you take a droplet and make two? And across evolution, that's done by a single strategy, basically by protein assemblies coupled to a compartment and then some energy source, right? Because you need to produce work. And you may think that, you know, across evolution, um, where there's so many different uh, forms of life that there might be like a million different ways to make two out of one, but that actually there's only three main ways. So, and it's nicely split according to the tree of life. So the tree of life has two prokaryotic unicellular branches. So there's organisms that live at single cells and don't have uh, much of internal compartmentalization. So on this side is bacteria. What they do to divide, they typically use something called FTZ filaments, which are kind of short and stiff filaments that form a ring in the middle of a cell. And because bacteria is kind of stiff and has um, high trigger pressure, probably they don't apply much force, but they're coupled to the synthetic machinery of the compartment of the cell wall. And somehow they help the synthetic machinery to organize itself and build a wall in the middle. Now there's another side, um, which is called archaea. They're different, they're quite floppy. And what they use, at least this more evolved archaea, use something called escort three filaments, which are long and flexible filaments, as opposed to short and stiff. They also form a ring in the middle and they go through active geometry changes to split the cell in two. Um, sorry, I forgot to, uh, my watch. Um, okay, so these are these two main ways. And then at some point, the um, two branches merged into, con into a symbiotic organism that eventually gave rise to us, to eukaryotes. So our, to do that, archaea most likely grew around other archaea and bacteria. And bacteria went to become our mitochondria. And archaea gave us our outer membrane and cell nucleus. So actually the machinery we use to reshape cell, cell membranes comes from this branch of the tree of life, also our cell cycle control and so on. So we, as eukaryotes, still use this s 3 filaments to split the cell when it's squished to about one micron, which is the size of the typical archaea. But then, because the symbiotic organism is much bigger, it invented an additional mechanism on top of it, which is optimized network, um, which is basically a network of um, active filaments that have some sort of isotropic pneumatic transition in the middle that squishes the cell. So it does that these three ways, and we've been playing with all three uh, to a certain extent in the last couple of years. Today, I'll tell you a bit about archaea, where this s 3 film is the division. They also do trafficking um, in archaea and eukaryotes. And then in the end, I'll tell you a little bit about our uh, model for FTZ filament ring formation. And just about a general strategy. So we are a computational group. Um, and I mean, clearly to produce this work at a whole cell scale, you need to take individual molecules, many of those, and make an assembly that works at a continuum scale. So what we argue that to capture the key physics of this process, you don't necessarily need to know or even want to know where each atom and each water molecule go at each point in time, but you still kind of need to retain the granularity of the building blocks. So what we do is we describe the building blocks as only the key ingredients that we think are important for the physics, such as their shape or effective interactions. And then we can study the assembly of a large number of those and measure how they perform at a continuum scale and kind of compare to um, basically continuum experiments like microscopy experiments, as I'll show you um, in the rest of the talk. Um, and so on the side of archaeal division, I should first give credit to people who did the work in my group. Uh, there, was, there were two great generations of women who did the modeling, Anna and Elena. Elena even managed to have two beautiful babies during her PhD, then Sharon and Billy. And biology was done at LMB in Cambridge um, by Buzz Baum and his team, Gabriel, Andrea, and Frederick. 
Okay, so I'll start with what Vaz managed to do. So he grew the closest archaeal relative to our cells that can be grown in a lab. It's called Sulfulobus and comes from Yellowstone National Park. So it lives at extreme conditions like at pH 2 and 80 Celsius. So it took them a couple of years to develop a microscope to image the division of these cells. And this is what they um, managed to image. So the DNA has somehow been divided. This is the cell membrane. And the way the cell uh, content is divided is the first one filament formed in the middle of a cell. This is escort filament here in pink. And that filament templates another escort filament, just another isoform of the protein here in green. So together, these two filaments stay um, happily, nothing happens. And then energy is consumed in form of ATP. So there's an ATPase that comes and chews up the template filament, the pink one. So it's disassembled. And then the top one, the, uh, the green filament, somehow squishes the cell in two. So we kind of like this idea as polymer physicists of two polymers that somehow work together to apply uh, work. So uh, we imagine the first filament, the pink one, as a stiff filament that matches the cell curvature, and the green one as a filament that wants to have smaller radius of curvature, but it can bind to the membrane only when the first one is present. So it's going to be stretched like a loaded spring. And when the template is there, nothing will happen. But when the template is disassembled, like you know, releasing a stop clock, this loaded spring will be released and will squish the cell into it. And that was our uh, idea. And then to test whether this is physically possible, we built really the model of the filaments out of beads connected by springs. So the, mem the cell is described as a fluid uh, deformable membrane. I will not go into the details of the model, but we'll be happy to discuss it later. The filament is basically beads connected by springs. And then to model the filaments, two filaments together, we have these beads connected by springs um, at a curvature that matches the cell curvature. And then to capture this uh, idea that when the first filament is disassembled, the green one wants to have smaller radius of curvature and squishes, we suddenly change the radius of curvature of the filament by simply shortening the bonds between these um, building blocks. So we shorten the bonds that increases the curvature of the filament, and then we um, look basically what happens. So we run Langevin dynamic simulations, uh, implicit um, water simulations. So I'll show you, we start with a cell, with a filament that kind of matches its curvature. Nothing is really happening uh, when the curvatures are equal. And then we suddenly change the curvature of the filament to a smaller radius. And what happens is filament coils up, it squishes the cell, but of course it stays there. <laughs> it doesn't let the cell uh, to divide. And indeed, if you go back to uh, cells and measure the um, content of this protein in the cytoplasm as the cell divides, it goes up, meaning the filament disassembles as the cell constricts. And actually our collaborators have recently managed to prevent the disassembly of the filament. And it's very nice, like what you can see is that the cell cannot divide, the filament stays in the middle. And you can actually see the two filaments very clearly. So there is one in the middle of the cell that wants to have a smaller radius of curvature and another one that kind of separates from it because it wants to have larger radius of curvature. Okay, so we start disassembling, but basically cutting the bonds. And what we see is, of course, if you disassemble too quickly, nothing happens. In these non-equilibrium games, you need to do things with the right rate, with the right protocol. But if you let the filament uh, change its curvature and disassemble slowly enough, the membrane will have time to adapt to go to a tight neck. And then as the filament is disassembled, the neck will not be supported by the filament inside anymore. It will be at high curvature. The thermal fluctuation will um, destabilize it and the membrane will naturally get cut kind of into two parts. So we're happy about that. But what I thought was kind of the main value of um, this exercise is that now we can start comparing to live cell data. So we got a bunch of cells from Buzz um, and as physicists, we quickly learned that these are living organisms, can have different sizes, can take different time to divide. But then we realized if we measure their neck as they're dividing and scale it by the initial cell size and take the time scaled by the uh, division time, we get all the experimental data to fall onto the same curve. So um, kind of 
several tens of different cells with different dyes and um, also slightly different um, fixation conditions. So you know, as, as for physicists, this is uh, as good as it can get. And then we're looking for a protocol of the change in curvature that will give us the same curve, basically. And I can tell you like how you do your change in curvature, basically how you would remove this template filament matters, right? The protocol matters. It matters for um, whether the cell will divide or not, how symmetrically it will divide, how efficiently. So we studied all of that um, in the paper. I will not go into great details. I will just say that the only way we were able to get this experimental curve is if the fi filament changes its curvature at a random point, which uniformly distributes the tension, also uh, gives a symmetric distribution of the protein and gives the exact same curve without any fitting as um, the experiment. So um, and just a, a small um, kind of comment for a uh, polymer physicist. I mean, I told you we we're going to change the filament shape from a ring into a tight helix. But what actually happened, what you can see here in this zoomed uh, inversion, is this the filament transformed in some sort of super coiled filament. Um, and that's simply due to buckling instability. So when you would quickly change the curvature, filament can get trapped in some metastable state. It's the same physics as your coiling of your Christmas tree, but if you do it very quickly, it will be um, kind of all super coiled. If you do it slower, you can have a nicer, um, nicer spiral. Um, and actually, we had lots of, lots of discussions uh, with our colleagues. We think that this super coiling is actually functional, that it helps the whole filament to shorten and kind of constrict the cell. So we had lots of discussions with our collaborators. They were claiming, OK, you can see it uh, at a macro scale, like in your ribbon or, or whatever. But there is no such a shape at the nanoscale filaments. And it's actually not true. So we went back to. Uh, structures of s core city filaments that have been reported. So we don't have structures for archaea, but we have them for uh, yeast and human. And what people report as helices are actually these kind of super coiled helices. So that might be functional. And this also makes a prediction. If you manage to slow down these ATPAs that choose up the first filament, you should change the slope of this curve, the shape of the filament. And very recently, we also got some stat images from the supercoiling filament, which is here in green, the membrane is in red. And it could be that these little kinks that are coming out of plane um, are these supercoils to be shown. Okay, um, and then just to, in the next couple of minutes, I'll take you kind of two billion years of evolution ahead. So um, our cells, eukaryotic cells, got escort from archaea, and we still use it to divide to do the cytokinetic bridge scission, which is around one micron, basically the same size of archaea. But we also adapted escort to do all sorts of other topological changes to the membrane. So actually, escort machinery is the only machinery that can cut all the membranes in a eukaryotic cell, both a plasma membrane, a nuclear membrane, internal membranes. So it's used to produce vesicles, to shed exosomes, viruses hijack it to uh, release out of the cell. But it's kind of, that's a change that's happening at a different scale than uh, cell division, right? So release of a vesicle or, or a virus happens at a scale of like tens of nanometers. Um, so we're super happy to be contacted by Aurelian Ruse group in Geneva, who managed to reconstruct in vitro escort trafficking from yeast. Um, that produces small vesicles. And so, you know, in Archaea, I showed you there, there's two or now we know three filaments. In humans, there is 11 S core three types and they can probably all, all polymerize and it's much more complicated. So in yeast, there is, let's say five to seven. So it's a, it is a more uh, complicated system, but what we see is that kind of the key physics is the same. So what I managed to show in vitro is that to get shedding of small vesicles, what occur, what happens is that the filament, there's again, multiple filaments, one, let's say spiral instead of a ring, another one helical, um, and let's say the third one, a tighter helix. And what I see is that these filaments replace one another and in such a way constrict the membrane to a tighter and tighter neck. So um, to kind of capture this process in a minimal system, we again thought of a very similar model, but now instead of a ring and a tight um, a ring, we have a spiral and a white helix and a tight helix. 
and we uh, assemble them in stages, just like what they see in the experiment. And we see that you, when you get a spiral, nothing happens, helix deforms, tighter helix deforms even tighter, but we cannot really get a shedding of small vesicles unless we include cargo. So cargo for us is just a bead that lightly attaches to the membrane, but not enough to wrap around the membrane on its own. And now we see when the filament goes through its compositional changes, which change its overall geometry, what you get is you get a tight neck. But now when the last filament is disassembled, the membrane cannot retract back because there is cargo in the way. And then the ne next best thing that occurs is basically membrane scission. So this is kind of the first physical model for this neck scission from the inside, again, by um, shape changes of copolymeric filaments. And often here, I like to remind my bio colleagues that you know, this might look cute, might have pretty colors, but they're not animations. They are true physical simulations based on correct physics, um, taking you know, the model, the minimal model that we assume. Okay, and then you know you might wonder why would nature bother? Why would you have all these different filaments? Is that if you have a tight one, why wouldn't you just put that one on a membrane and drill in? Why would you bother replacing one after another? So you can test that in simulations. You cannot do it in experiment. So what we see, um, what Bill and my group did, is that when you take the full path, the full pathway. Um, multiple filaments replacing each other, the energy for deformation simply goes downhill. However, if you just put the last filament, there's a huge barrier, right? Because you need to change the membrane from flat into a very tight neck in a single step. And probably this, um, you know, multiple steps serve the purpose um, to lower the barrier and to enable the process to occur in finite time. Okay, so I'll wrap up here on um, the archaeal and escort side. So what I showed you is that active changes in filament composition drive global geometry changes, either from ring to helix in case of archaeal division or spiral to helix in case of small vesicle budding. And then this filament geometry change is transferred to the membrane. And it is kind of a different type for forced production at the nanoscales as opposed to actin and microtubules that consume energy at the level of individual molecule. Here you get a whole dead a nanoscale structure that's completely remodeled to produce force. And in the group, we like this um, angle of learning about physics of life by studying it throughout evolution, because of course, if you go um, back in ta evolutionary time, the machinery is likely simpler, but hopefully the key physical principles are preserved. And now in the last couple of minutes, um, I'll tell you about the other side of the tree of life, which is bacteria, which is a different strategy. It's FTZ filaments that form a ring in the middle and are then coupled to synthetic machinery. So we'll not speak about full division, but just about the ring formation. Um, and as opposed to archaea, I told you that has kind of long, flexible filament. Here we have a ring that's made of many short and stiff filaments. And I'll ho hopefully you'll be able to see the way um, the division uh, happens is that you have um, dispersed proteins that then condense into a ring and then the division is targeted, it started. So kind of diffuse, diffuse, and then you see this very bright ring and that triggers the division. And we know from um, Seamus Holden Group um, in works experiments that if you block this ring, um, condensation, the division cannot happen. So the wall synthesis does not occur. And what's really cr crucial also for this um, ring formation is the fact that these filaments dynamically grow and shrink. So they treadmill. And we're kind of wondering why this dynamic growing and shrinking kind of dying and re uh, being born again filaments, why is that important for the ring formation, which is then um, important for the division? In my group that's been done by Chris in collaboration with Seamus and also Martin does at um, ISTA who does um, who, who studies this pro uh, process in vitro. Okay, so uh, unlike archaea, bacteria has been studied uh, much, much more. So we know so much about kind of the process of the FTZ nucleation, growth, and so on. 
So very briefly, we developed the Monte Carlo model to study the nucleation growth of filaments. What we have is basically monomers that nucleate grow. And now to capture this treadmilling, um, what we do is we add monomers on one side and then monomers within the filament can hydrolyze and with, with certain probability. And with such a monomer appears at the end of the filament, it goes away. And then that, if these rates are tuned, that can give you filaments that grows and shrink with equal rates. So it looks like it's translating, but actually it's not. It's very important for its dynamics and the ring formation. So um, we um, all these parameters can kind of be measured for FTZ, which is great. And then we can also check uh, our data, for instance, the distribution of velocities of the filaments or their lifetime against uh, high-speed FM data from the Luz group, and we were super happy to see that they match, match quite well. But then what we were really looking for is to study their collective behavior. So what now, what we Angela, do... Angela, about five minutes. Well, thank you. So what we now do is we nucleate a bunch of filaments in a box, so they grow and shrink with equal rates, so they treadmill. Again, as a single filament, it looks like they're uh, translating, but they're really growing and shrinking. And what we saw that happens naturally over time is they align. Um, but unlike your favorite kind of self-propelled filaments or rods, they do not align by pushing against each other because they're not pushing, they're growing and shrinking. And actually, if you go back to um, the in vitro data in under high-speed FM, you can also very uh, nicely see that at low densities, they kind of have random orientation, but as the density of monomers increase, the filaments start aligning. But now, um, what's the mechanism of this alignment? It's actually, it's interesting. Um, what, what we saw in simulations occurring is that if a filament grows under a certain angle opposite against its neighbors, it cannot grow, right? It's due to volume exclusion, but it can still shrink. So what will happen is that filaments that are not parallel with its neighbors will on average shrink, and, but only those that are parallel with its neighbors could keep on growing. And on average, over a long time, this gives you alignment. Um, and then we wanted to see whether this mechanism can give rise to the ring formation. So we needed two more ingredients for that. We needed curvature, such that the filaments can go perpendicularly. And also we needed something to position them in the middle of a cell. And we know that in bacteria, there are underlying reaction diffusion reactions, um, which um, enable filaments to preferentially nucleate and grow in the middle of a cell. It's probably how the cell measures its size. Okay, so now we added a special temporal uh, pattern of nucleation and uh, growth rates. And what we see is uh, that the um, ring naturally forms, actually quite um, packed, um, um, high packing. But then again, okay, now we unwrapped it back to a cylinder um, and you can see this ring growing and running around. But again, what I thought was um, nice is that now we can compare to live cell data. So what we got from the Holden lab is the ring density and width in time. And what we see is that the ring um, width um, shrinks very quickly on the scale of under a minute. So the ring nucleates very quickly and it's really triggered by this underlying uh, reaction diffusion. But then it grows very slowly over tens of minutes. And it's exactly what we see in simulations. And the reason why it grows much slower than it nucleates is that it needs, there, it needs time to select against these misaligned filaments. So when the filament is misaligned, it needs to shrink and then grow again and try again and try again. And eventually you'll get only the parallel ones to survive. And then um, what was kind of confusing from experiment for uh, a while is that these rings run faster and faster with time. So um, when the ring just forms, there's a bunch of stuck filaments. As it matures, the average velocity is higher. And that's exactly what we see in, in simulation. And the reason is, again, um, quite trivial. When the ring just forms, there's a lot of misaligned filaments, a lot of stuck filaments that contribute zero velocity. But then as they get selected against, you get a ring that runs faster and faster. Okay, so I'll wrap up here. Um, and I've shown you a bit of... Um, Kind of different active matter uh, of filaments that um, are born and die dynamically, which gives rise to their alignment. And I think this shows that 
why is this thread mailing important for ring formation? It's important because allows it allows for the selection of misaligned filaments, for them basically to die and try to grow again until they're all parallel and kind of condensed, such that they can probably trigger the synthetic machinery around them, which is something uh, we are working on now and are quite interested to see. Um, whether such a ring produces any force and how it couples to synthetic machinery of the cell wall to, in the end, divide the cell. Okay, and I'll just uh, thank my group, um, the escort team I mentioned, um, and then on the bacterial side, um, it was mainly done, the work was mainly done by Chris. Everything we know about escort and evolution we learned from Buzz Aurelian, and Rivka helped with um, steady imaging. And Seamus and Martin taught us a lot about bacteria and bacterial division. And yes, oh yeah, if you know anyone looking for PhD or postdocs and wants to live in Imperial Vienna, please send them to us and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much for that uh, great talk. There's a couple of questions in, in the chat. Um, the, the first one is, um, your supercoiled filaments remind me of chromatin. Is there anything in common, or are there any models that apply to both? Yeah, um, I mean, it's again, you know, filament that's probably under certain tension that can be released. So there, there were a couple of papers showing or indicating the supercoiling in, um, in in chromatin in actual living cell. Um, and actually, it's the same physics as perhaps, you know, the work by Mahadevan on the shape of the gut. Um, so the gut has also the supercoiled shape. People thought it's because it grows inside a cavity, but then when they grew a chick gut under, um, like in a Petri dish, it still had the same shape. It's because they're kind of two soft filaments that grow at different rates. So they pull on each other. There's some tension that it's released in form of a buckling stability. Um, so yeah, it's the same physics. And there, there needs to be an active process. In this case, the, there's an active disassembly of one of the two filaments that applies tension to another filament that then is released in form of this supercoiling. Great, let's see. The next question here is from a physical point of view, would it be useful and, re and related if we think of the process as a Markovian model? Oh. Jeremy, um, like I mean, if, okay. So first of all, there is energy input here um, that you know we, we put in uh, cutting the bonds, um, um, changing the the shape, and so on. Um, I guess I, I I don't know what kind of data would you like to get. Like, what would you um, like to compare with? Maybe yeah, maybe um, there can be a bit of. Um, yeah, sure. Feel free. The original uh, question, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask. Um, Aria. What would you like to get? I think maybe. Okay. Well, maybe we can. Perhaps we could save that for the for the time afterwards. We can um, we can go on to the, the next question for now, is which is do you have evidence for anomalous diffusion of the filament monomers in the presence of the partially formed FTSZ helices? This is from Greg Huber. He says, I have some old calculations indicating there should be. Well, that's interesting. Um, I see um, because it's crowded and kind of hitting one another. So we don't have any resolution, any monomer resolution for, or um, yeah, experimentally. And then in simulations, what we do is we kind of add a monomer to the top, to the head of the filament uh, from, um, a reservoir and remove it from the other end. So we don't explicitly model the diffusion. I think that is a valid point. Like um, also when a monomer leaves, it's probably going to hang out closer. So it might be added to another filament that's closer to the tail of um, the previous one. So we didn't have add just a little bit of uh, yeah. um, explanation to my question, which was when you have those helical tracks, you kind of convert 2D diffusion to something that's between the monomers, so uh, between the helices. So it's a little bit like a one-dimensionalizing the diffusion uh, if it's in plane, if it's in the plane of the membrane, let's say. 
Um, that that's what I meant. That um, that uh, uh, again, it's a kind of den it's a kind of crowding, but it's crowding with these parallel structured uh, helical uh, tracks, if you like, <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, no, no, that you could okay. diffuse in the space between the tracks, but you can't cross a track because that's actually uh, associated with the membranes. Right, yeah. No, that's super interesting. We don't have that in our model um, and we don't see monomers in, in experiment, but it's also my impression that um, there's an abundance of monomers in, in the cell. So it also comes from kind of solution. Yes. Yeah, not you. only by in 2D, it's such a sure. yep. neighbors.